welcome to Junior High. This is the Battle Series. Okay, well, maybe not quite that kind of battle, although I think it would be super dope if we could all build robots and battle them together. That would be so epic. I'd love to do that. But uh, I think we all kind of have a little bit of a battle story. My battle stories all come from the football field. I remember my first ever time stepping on a football field. I was jacked up. I was ready to go. I was playing safety, which is like the guy right at the back. And uh, on the other team, there was this big guy. Not just like big, but like, fast and strong and heavy. Anyway, so I'm sitting back there. I'm not a big guy, I'll just be honest here. But I'm sitting back there, I watch him. He's coming through the hole, right through my lane. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna get this guy. So I step up, oh, thankfully he just starts to trip and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna stop his momentum. So I put my shoulder down in to stop his momentum. Oh my goodness, I swear all the oxygen in my body left me all at once and like I just was so sore and I hit this guy, it was like hitting a brick wall, it was absolutely insane. But I played it off cool because you know, you gotta be tough, right, on the football field and that's about as epic as my battle stories get. I think most of us get the idea of what a battle is. We've all at least seen Gladiator or Lord of the Rings or the Avengers or the epic battle of good versus evil. Phineas and Ferb versus Dr. Doofenshmirtz. But we also really don't get it in the same way because we live in one of the only places in the world and in the only time in world history where battles haven't really been a part of everyday life. Like, think about it. Even if you lived like 2,000 year, years ago, battles on like an epic scale were just par for the course. Empire against empire, even just like local small battles. Your life depended on you being able to defend yourself like some warrior out of a book. Nowadays, if we just don't like our neighbor, we just unfollow them on, them on Instagram, right? Not really an epic tale worth telling to your grandkids. I mean, guys, don't get me wrong. I'm glad that I don't live in a time where I have to worry about bandits coming uh, to, and attacking me on my commute home. We aren't ready to fight at any given moment. We don't have this idea of battle in our mind at all times. And uh, that's what I want us to think about today is that we are in a battle every moment of every day. Where's the battle? Where is the enemy? Guys, here's the reality. We face a very real, invisible enemy who wants to tear us down. Not to destroy us with swords or fists, but with ideas and lies. And today, guys, I want to get open and honest about the battle that happens in the mirror. All right, let's be honest. We all have things about ourselves that we don't like. And that's where I think the battlegrounds are today. Looking in the mirror, you know, like that epic scene of every battle movie where there's the good guys on the one side and the bad guys on the other and they're, they're rushing towards each other. That's what I'm talking about, but it's easy to be ready for a battle like that. But I was really surprised the other day, guys, when I stepped up to the mirror to get ready for the day and I saw the enemy looking back at me. Okay, not like one of those weird horror movie movies. Oh, I saw them in the mirror. What I mean is I got in front of the mirror the other day and I was just assaulted with a thousand negative thoughts about myself. Things that, that we hear like, and maybe you hear some stuff like this. You're a failure, or you have no friends, or you're not pretty enough, your ears look funny, you aren't a person of integrity, or you'll never be a good leader, or a good student, or whatever. Guys, I didn't expect to see the enemy charging at me out of the mirror that morning. But it got to the point where I couldn't even like look myself in the eye. But there's a real, very real and active enemy who fights not with weapons, but with words, with negative thoughts and with lies. Because guys, he wants to battle God's truth about us. And his victory is called discouragement. Has anybody else felt discouraged over the last year? And so here's the question that guys we want to wrestle with is when I look in the mirror and I, and I hate what I see, what do I do? It's called the battle of discouragement and how the en it's how the enemy is trying to take us down. So how do we fight back? I'm not sure what it is for you, what you see in the mirror. And, and I want you and God wants you to be able to look in the mirror and love what you see because, because you reflect God. You reflect the king of the universe. But so many of us have a hard time looking in the mirror and making eye contact with ourselves or feeling that we are loved, you know, maybe by God or by our others or, or even by ourselves. Here's the questions that come up for me. Does God have anything to say for us when we're discouraged about what we see in the mirror? 
Like, what do I do when it's true? Like, when I look in the mirror and I'm dealing with the, the ugliness that I see, like, the things that are really bad, I don't mean like, oh, I don't like my nose, but what do I do when I see, I look in the mirror and see, man, I've become unkind or I've become selfish. Things that maybe God is showing me that need to change. But what difference can God make in the battle of discouragement? And what I think about myself, well, I got a couple battle points. And, and the first one, guys, is this. The first battle point is, guys, is that it is about the pit. We are all going to find ourselves in the pit at some point. I was listening to this book this week and they're talking about three pits, like one of those uh, tiger traps, you know, that you walk across the holes covered up with leaves. So you fall in and get, get out, can't get out. Well, the pit is like this image of discouragement or, or when you feel like life just sucks or like it's falling apart. And they said that, that there are three pits that we, that we get into. There's pits that we walk into, pits that we fall into and pits that we're thrown into. Like, like maybe right now, the pit that you're in is, man, it's because of your poor decisions. You walked right in there. And I want to say to you guys, hey, God's not done with you. But maybe it's one that you just fell into. It's just an accident. It's just life. Like you weren't on guard and it happened. I think a lot of us find ourselves right now in a pit that we were thrown into. Like we've had no choice about COVID and maybe it has you discouraged or maybe um, you're in a pit because of other people's choices and the way that they hurt you. And no matter what, guys, whatever kind of pit you're in, I want you to know it's the enemy that wants to use that pit to discourage you. He wants to wreck your life, but God is reaching down so he can help you out. So guys, we need to know how to get into the battle. We need to know how to get out. And here's what I want to say first, guys. It's not your fault to be in there. It's just life. And, but the thing is, we just want to learn how to get out of the pit. Because guess what? At some point, every single one of us are going to be in pits. And, and guys, you guys are young and I'm young. There's actually more and more difficult pits coming. But guys, if we can learn now how to get out of that, how to walk through discouragement with courage and how to walk through it with God, but guys, if we can learn how to do that now, that's going to be huge for the future things where we're going to be able to get up and walk out of them rather than have the enemy destroy our life while we're in the pit. Hey, I want to tell you a quick story of somebody who found themselves in the pit. Uh, you guys might know King David, you know, the guy who slayed giants and, and became the king of Israel. And his story is recorded in 1st and 2nd Samuel. And David found himself in a pit because here's what happened, guys. David started off great, but he made some bad choices in life. He walked into a pit and here's what happened is, you know, he saw this lady and she was looking nice and, but she was somebody else's wife. So he slept with her anyway, had the guy murdered. And guys, from that point on in David's story, things just start to really go downhill, especially in his family life. And here's what happens is that his son Absalom grows up and, and becomes jealous of him because, you know, David's family's just crumbling apart. And so what Absalom does is he actually makes a run at David's throne. I want to read it for you here. It's out of 2 Samuel 16 and 17. It says this. Um, um, so Absalom asks this guy, Ahithophel, what should we do? He says, go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house and, uh, and tell all Israel will hear that you have made a stench for your father and the hands of all who are with you will be strength. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof. Absalom went into his father's concubines at, in all the sight of Israel. Let me choose 12,000 men and I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he is weary and discouraged and throw him into a panic and all the people uh, are, who are with him uh, will flee and I will strike down only the king. And guys, honestly, David walked into that pit. He's the one who got himself in that situation. His bad choices led to this, this absolutely life tearing down moment. But here's the thing, guys, David didn't let the pit destroy him. You know, he would be on the run for the next three years. And we don't actually have a ton of stories from uh, that time uh, in David's life, but we have a lot of songs. And, and what's really cool is, is we have some of those songs that are recorded and we can see that, you know what? David trusted that God was gracious. David trusted that God would not leave him there, that God was actually going to help him out, that there was actually going to be a day where God would, would set him back up on the rock. Even in his darkest time, David trusted that there was a God uh, who cared for him. That, that even if he looked in the mirror and saw his failures, if he, even if he looked in the mirror and saw his family that was a wreck, or the people who were literally trying to kill him, he could look and he saw that there was a God who looked back at him and, and was going, going to be faithful. And so I just want to read out of Psalm chapter 40. 
And these are the words of David. And he said this in Psalm chapter 40. I waited patiently for Yahweh. He inclined to me and he heard my cry. He drew me up out of the pit of destruction, out of my miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. For evils encompass me beyond numbers, and my iniquity had overtaken me. I cannot see. They are more than the hairs on my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O Yahweh, deliver me. O Yahweh, make haste to help me. See, guys, David trusted in God even in the darkest pit. Man, and I just want that for us. Maybe maybe you're going through something really hard. Maybe you walked into it. Maybe you fell into it. Um, Maybe somebody threw you into it. Maybe this time of COVID has been so tough. But guys, just remember, God's not going to leave you in that pit. He wants to set your feet back up on a rock. Because you might be saying, okay, Chris, but you don't know my story. Like, how is this true for me? How, how?" and here's how I would answer this, guys. is that God showed up because God puts himself in our mess. We look in the mirror and all we see is failure or hurt. But guys, God has actually done something to deal with that. One of my favorite passages of scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And one of the verses in it says this, For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. And I want you to let that sink in. See, here's what it's saying is that God sees your mess. But instead of looking at you and defining you by your mess, Jesus says, that mess is mine. I'll carry it. See, guys, God doesn't count your failures because Jesus counted them to be carried by him. Here's what else it means. Guys, other people's brokenness and hurts, uh, it, it can hurt you, but it can't define you because God, what God sees in you matters more. You might look in the mirror and hate what you see, but God is asking you to see what he sees. And he sees someone so valuable that he took on all of your mess and carried it on himself and so that he could give you his right standing with God. Guys, the lies that we hear in the mirror, they don't have power anymore because God's truth says that you are worth dying for. The king of the world died for you. You have value, even if you've messed up, even if you walked into the pit yourself. And here's the last thing it means, that you and I can actually change when we trust Jesus with our whole selves. Man, from messed up and hurt into God's righteousness, you might see every flaw in the mirror. But God sees perfection because Jesus has given you his perfection. He wants to, to hold you hold, and hold your mess so that you can become part of his perfection. It's like, it's like when we start to trust in Jesus. Yeah, it starts slow and we start messy, but God actually starts to change us. And when you start to trust Jesus with your whole life, you know, he rescues you from the pit and God actually starts to change you. Like, like I can just a couple of verses before, Paul says this, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone. The mess is gone and the new has come. You might look in the mirror and see junk, but God has taken your junk into Jesus and made you literally a new kind of person, the kind of people that that we can become who look in the mirror and love what they see because they see God at work. They see someone who loves others, someone who does justice for the powerless. We become the kind of people who that reflect Jesus into the world. And there's actually something to be really proud of in that. Guys, it was hard for me that morning to look past my flaws. It was hard to look myself in the eye, but we had to remember that, that shame is from the enemy. Shame uh, is, is from the one who wants to keep us in the pit because God sees our mess, but he cleans it up. It's still hard, but we gotta find a way to go to battle in the mirror. Guys, it's not gonna happen all at once, but Jesus takes your mess on himself. Because here's the thing, guys, is that we might see lies in the mirror, but we need to go to battle because God says, that Jesus took your mess so that he could give you his perfection. When you look in the mirror, I want you to look in the mirror and I want you to see what God sees. He sees not your mess, that's been dealt with. He doesn't see the brokenness, that's been dealt with. What he sees is the perfect life that Jesus lived on your behalf and invites you into. Guys, it's not even just that that Jesus lived in and, and, and he was the perfect one. But he actually wants to do that work in your life. He actually can start to transform you. I know it takes time. Man, guys, a lot of you are just starting your journey with Jesus. Maybe you haven't even started your journey with Jesus yet. Trust the process. Take the time. Wait on God like David did and trust that there will be a day when he's going to lift you out of that pit and set you back on, on a rock where you can stand. And guys, when you look in the mirror, see what God sees. He sees perfection. He's dealt with your mess. Guys, God loves you so much 
when he looks at you, God, God sees you with so much love that he himself would become sin so that you could become right with God. Man, that's so good. Hey, we got one last battle point when we're going to do that live.